thank you, Katarina and Eugenia, for the invitation and for organizing this. I'm really very, very happy to be here, and I'm honored to be sharing this panel with Professor Chappell. So I prepared a few ideas, and I circulated them, and uh, Professor Chappell was kind enough to read them in advance and prepare a reply. So we are uh, kind of uh, coordinated with this, and I think our contributions can, can complement each other very well. The motive and the title of my presentation is this. I'm, I want to suggest or propose thinking of uh, safe spaces as maybe a mirage uh, in the cases in which these safe spaces are understood as a way of uh, achieving or getting closer to social justice. Um, but I would, would like to start a little bit before. Uh, since the beginning of my research, I have always been interested in analyzing and in trying to understand the strategies that social movements adopt, uh, mainly those linked with gender and sexualities, um, to approach or get closer to what they identify as social justice. And a part, as, as a part of this quest, uh, I have recently become interested in these, uh, how these strategies have concentrated more and more on the spectrum of punishment studying I've been studying the tradition of prison abolition and anti-repression anti-repressive antifa culture and so forth and learning about alternative models of justice and reparation um, and this has been a big uh, long learning process which is still ongoing and I, I think this space is also part of that process um, and many times I've found uh, this idea of safe, safe spaces as one element that also is included in these uh, punitivist or punishment-centered um, strategies. And that is how, what got me worried with the idea of space, safe spaces, actually. And that is the, the starting point for my ideas here today. Um, so I would like to start uh, laying out some, some broad uh, points of this idea of safe spaces and then I would like to explain why I think they don't actually exist and especially why I think that they are um, a mirage that is something that not only doesn't exist but it can also be harmful uh, and contrary to the aims of social justice. Uh, and to to wrap up I will I will share some questions that I think we could address collectively um, considering what we want with safe spaces and how this can be achieved. So first for the general idea of, of safe spaces, uh, this is a proposal that uh, has uh, arisen and taken place mainly in the field of activism and education. I will focus particularly, as I said, on some aspects of its implementation in activism and in movements related to gender justice, mainly feminist movements and LGBT and feminists. Um, so a safe space is understood as a space in which socially marginalized people or people who have endured certain forms of violence can exist, can express themselves uh, without exposure or without fear of exposure to mistreatment, to ridicule, to, to questioning their, of their credibility, their authenticity. So it's, it can also work as a space to heal the wounds that have been inflicted in the outside of that space in, in broader systems of oppression. Uh, Hooks, uh, Bell Hooks proposes this idea of a, space, a safe space as a place to heal our wounds uh, collectively. Um, they are generally delimited on the basis of an identity or a, a political self-identification. These are the kinds of space, safe spaces I will focus on in this presentation. I understand that Professor Chappell will um, propose some other uh, analyzing or, or exploring some other possibilities for safe spaces, but in my case, I would focus on this. Um, so this often means that uh, group consciousness, uh, this is uh, a quotation from Waldis Puel, uh, group consciousness is constructed around the largest common denominator, for example, gender oppression, rather than after an intersecting, intersecting conception of oppressions and experiences that are related to sexuality or to other identities. And additionally, this interpreted that the inclusion of these identities can be achieved through the exclusion of other identities. And so this 
this interplay between inclusion and exclusion is one of the things that I found more uh, worrying about safe spaces. These are the spaces I am going to refer to in, in, in my presentation, the spaces that are defined as, as safe spaces due to certain identity-based inclusions and exclusions based on identity or on political affiliation. For example, only feminists, which some could argue is also an identity. Um, so um, safe spaces, can implement an what, what is called an inclusive separatism. So they admit some identities that are not the ones that define the space, but are not perceived as dangerous. Or they can also uh, operate uh, an exclusion of any other, any other identity um, when, when they seek to like reassert their internal unity. Um, in a safe space, usually, uh, coexistent agreements are established, such as what terms can be used, what language can be used, how we should deal with conflict, how tasks are distributed, and so on. Um, and among these agreements, punitivism usually occupies an important place, although not in all safe spaces. In many of them, for example, one way of maintaining a safe space is um, implementing punitive measures, that is, punishment measures, mainly expulsion towards whoever does not comply with these coexistence rules, or uh, when the safe space is identity-based. Um, in its very constitution, uh, we often find the idea that certain types of subjects are dangerous or harm harmful, something which, in my understanding, is an important point uh, of agreement with progressive punitivism. Uh, in many feminist approaches, carceral feminism is an approach in which usually men uh, are, and however they are defined, are understood as in themselves threatening or dangerous. So they are excluded from these sp uh, spaces on an identitarian, almost essentialist basis. Um, so while it is, in my perspective, undeniable that there have been and are numerous projects that seek to build a, a safe space um, or that invest in safe spaces as a form of empowerment and as a platform for transformation, I believe that as such, safe spaces do not exist. Um, I am not, of course, the first person to say that this has been asserted at least since the beginnings of feminist separatism especially by women belonging to minority groups. For my part, uh, my analysis is from a philosophical perspective, from practical philosophy, and I am interested in understanding what is behind this idea of safe space and analyzing whether these assumptions are viable and or whether they are consistent with a gender justice project. I think this is a particularly philosophical exercise and I, I, I I understand that this is one of the contributions we can do from philosophy. So from this analysis of what, is, what are the assumptions behind this idea of uh, safe spaces from an identitarian um, uh, perspective, I would like to propose the following. Um, when we say that safe spaces exist, as they are often proposed by gender justice movements in our days, some or all of these uh, things are often assumed. First of all, that people can be defined on the basis of a single identity category or a political affiliation, for example, feminism, and that this category allows us to classify them into two or three groups, either safe or dangerous, or we, those who create the safe space, which of course are safe, you who are conditionally allowed in, and them who are dangerous and excluded. Uh, sometimes, uh, Bora says that sometimes an illusion of a safe space is created to claim that every single individual in that particular space enjoys the same feeling of safety. So this is um, an, an encompassing idea of what having that identity means in terms of how we live through or navigate a certain space. But uh, Bora says that we all know that our lives are not just about one identity, for example, being queer, that this, ide this identity has many identities within itself, and that sometimes uh, 
to talk about all these identities in one breath might create invisibilization of certain identities within it. So if when we use these encompassing ideas, Boda says, we are leaving out all the nuances and the complexities that inhabit that identity. So even within that identity, it is often, or political identification, um, it is often supposed that conflict will not emerge or that whichever conflict emerges is not sufficiently damaging or pernicious for the space to cease to be understood as safe. So either there is no conflict or conflict is moderate and manageable. This is something I will, I hope to come back to afterwards. Another assumption is that by sharing this category of this self-identification, the subjects are exempt from the exercise of other forms of oppression mainly those that do not affect them negatively. This is something that is very uncomfortable to say, but it's very often the case, at least in my experience. Um, this is reinforced by, by statements such as, if you are a transphobic, you're not a feminist, or if you're racist, you're not a feminist. This is uh, our slogans that circulate a lot, at least in, in the Argentine and the, I would say, Southern American context. Uh, I think they are very, uh, Apart from empirically incorrect, <laughs> they are very problematic from an ethical perspective and political perspective. So sometimes this is stated as, as wishful thinking, but it can also have mis a misleading effect uh, because it tends to deactivate the warning that even by identifying within feminism, it is possible to reproduce these forms of violence and other forms of violence. Um, Another other, other three points that are usually appear as, as uh, or don't appear actually, but are, uh, I think, underlying uh, these, the, these ideas of, of safe spaces is that one group of people, the fact that one group of people will be able to identify what a safe space is for the rest of the people who share that identity or that uh, uh, political affiliation. When in reality, what a safe space is, is defined on the basis of imaginary constructions that of course depend on the social place we occupy and our perceptions of the world, which of course are um, um, marked by our own experience and including our perceptions of what is safe and unsafe, what causes harm and so on. So the categories of safe and unsafe, Rosten say are socially produced and context dependent. Um, and this is difficult to bring up to a collective scale when it comes from a personal or a subgroup within this space. So of course, this is, these are not exempt from um, biases, prejudice and so on that are pervasive in our society. Another uh, assumption can be that people who are part of oppressed groups can be safe somewhere. Um, if we understand the different systems of oppression as systemic or structural, we are saying that they are present in all areas of society and in all people. They are tracker preju prejudice, which accompany people through their different social interactions, both in conscious and unconscious expressions. This is even more evident if we take into account that safe spaces are often proposed as occasions to talk about the violence we suffer and our views on those violences. In a 2013 study on safe spaces in social justice projects, Arion Clemens note that, I quote, target group members may in fact react with incredulity to the very notion of safety for history and experience has demonstrated clearly to them that to name their oppression and the perpetrators thereof is a profoundly unsafe activity, particularly if they are impassioned. So this is interesting because the safe spaces operate often with an invitation to speak up and talk about our own oppressions and our, our own experiences of oppression, but generally assuming that those narratives will not have as, um, the evil figures, uh, other people or other social types that are also inhabiting that safe space. 
So this brings us to the last point, that teaching and learning about oppression, for example, pointing out a certain action, a certain word, or an idea that we think that reproduces violence, affects equally the one who teaches, the person who suffers that oppression and points it out, and the one who supposedly learns, for whom an oppressive scene functions at best as a pedagogical scene, which is not even often the case. Safe spaces should be understood through the relationships that produce them, and that also means that they will have different meanings according to the place we occupy in that same space. The last uh, assumption is that the construction of a safe space is an effective starting point for the future expansion of safety to other spaces. That is that safety will not be confined to those spaces alone. We have, for example, in Argentina, the idea of friendly clinics. These are um, um, health uh, clinics that, are, uh, that present themselves as uh, friendly towards, for example, trans people or gays and lesbians uh, or whatever combination. And in general, this is, this is often criticized because people, are, people often say, well, all health uh, spaces should be friendly and not only those that have a little sign that say they are friendly, but the, 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 um, the investment here is in creating those safe spaces as a way of then expanding it to other um, environments as well. So none of, not all of these assumptions are necessarily at stake when building or proposing safe spaces. But many of them are, and they are often at the basis of the very proposal of safe space as an activist practice. I believe that these assumptions are erroneous. I think they are wrong because they fail to account for the complexity of social interactions and the depth of the structures of oppression we are dealing with. A depth that means that those of us who could be perceived as safe people are also embedded in these uh, oppressive practices and structures. This is why I say that I say that safe spaces, from my perspective, do not exist. Um, I do think that there is what Heather Rosenfeld and Elsa Noteman have called a paradoxical safe space. It's a safe space as a productive negotiation of unsafe space. So what does exist ontologically, if you want, is unsafe space. And we negotiate that unsafe space, and that is the safest we can get. The point here is how we go about that negotiation and what grounded agreements we establish to do so. In my own work, for instance, I have tried to identify and expose the limitations of the approaches that negotiate the terms of this space in a punitivist or punishment-related grammar. So beyond the existence, um, beyond the existence or not of spa safe spaces as spaces of empowerment and for the generation of social justice initiatives. It is often claimed that a place, a group, a course is a safe space. From my point of view, this statement is problematic both for individuals and for the movements of which they are part. Firstly, because when the limits of space are defined in terms of identity, as I said before, this is going to be my focus, it reinforces static and one-dimensional definitions of identities, which are established univocally by parts of the collective, which is precisely part of the problem we want to oppose. That is, for example, notions of women as victims, as essentially victims, essentially weak, and so on. Secondly, because in many cases, the opening of a safe space disables the responsibility of the people who construct or sustain that space to maintain an ongoing moral and political self-evaluation, collective self-evaluation. So it would seem that once those boundaries are established, safety is already guaranteed and we can just start to be free after that, free and carefree also. The third point seems to me the most worrying. By putting the label of safe space, the individual discomfort or harm of those who do not encounter safety in that space often becomes a re the responsibility of those who feel it because um, I have already established the conditions for them not to feel uh, 
uh, discomfort or not to feel harmed or not to be harmed. So what I offer them is a safe space. So in this, uh, in this um, process, victim blaming is spatialized. Um, so we blame the victims for the uh, harm they suffer and because they have suffered it within this safe space. And the last point is that um, because the illusion that it is a safe space may prevent the development of mechanisms to deal with conflicts or deep disagreement. This is related to the second point that just mentioned. Under the assumption that these disagreements will not appear or these conflicts will not take place. But it is precisely those mechanisms that we need to develop, not only to make the space welcoming, but to make all other spaces unsafe for violence. That is to make violence confronted, addressed and resolved. I think these are the capacities we have to uh, train in a way. We are already training, of course. In the absence of tools to deal with these small scale, scale conflicts, sorry, the path that appears to us as directly available is the most recurrent and obvious path in our culture, which is the path of punishment, mainly through expulsion. So this is why I refer to safe spaces as a mirage in the beginning, not just something that does not exist in reality, but also something whose illusion of existence triggers a number of actions and decisions that are detrimental to those who would supposedly benefit from its existence. So in closing, I have some ideas and questions about what complementary or alternative strategies could be pursued uh, or are already being tried. Um, first of all, that I think the safety of the space cannot be defined beforehand or vertically, but only on the basis of the experience of each subject in that space after having passed and navigated that space. Just as a status of ally cannot be self-assigned, but is rather assigned by the collective we hope to support. In the same way, the qualification of safe will depend on how each subject lives their passage through that space. And I will call your attention again to the illustration I put in the beginning, because this says safe zone, I am an ally, am I, I am understanding, I am not judgmental, I am here to listen, this is a safe zone. So for me, this is the example of what I'm, what I'm criticizing here. I am not the one that has to say if I am an ally, if I am understanding and so forth, uh, especially not in the beginning. <laughs> so we can set out to build a safe space uh, that, and, and, and this is a task, task that takes effort, takes reflection, dialogue and time. In this process, we cannot lose sight of the intent of the safe space we build which is not merely oppositional, uh, just like cutting ourselves out of the rest, but it is constructive or it should be constructive. So what do we want to build with that safe space? And then on the basis of that, we can determine what kind of actions, strategies, words do we want to encourage and which ones we don't want to encourage. And how are we going to deal with the ones we don't? beyond saying that they will not be admitted, which is what appears in a way in the sign that I just, I just showed. Yeah. Um, um, another point is that the collective establishment through dialogue of, of guidelines for coexistence and mechanisms for dealing with cases when these, uh, these shared norms are not met, seems to me more important than that of ad admission requirements. So we could, instead of having admission requirements, especially in relation to identities, we can have guidelines for coexistence. And of course, these guidelines have to be in coherence with what we are seeking to achieve. Andrea Zanin said that, in her opinion, it's much better to create spaces where there are a few clear rules of acceptable behavior that don't depend on any kind of identity or status, gender or otherwise, an explicit expectation of kindness and good faith, and a person or persons who are in charge of smoothing things if they go all wrong. Of course, 
an explicit expectation of kindness and good faith, that's not, it's not the end of the problem, it's the beginning of some kind of, or the, the end of the solution, it's the beginning of some kind of path towards a safer space. This task requires a permanent revision because both the identities and the political projects that give birth to these spaces are relational and dynamic. So we are all the time learning how these safe spaces should be and we, all, we are all the time revising our own, or we should be all the time revising our own practices. Rosenfeld and Notemann, whom I mentioned before, say because safe spaces are responses to particular problems, we must abandon a dream of an infinite trajectory towards increasing safety in chronological time and space. And finally, taking up the legacy of queer pedagogies, I invite us to uh, make friends with the idea, as we say in Spanish, uh, to reconcile ourselves with the idea of safe spaces as spaces of uncertainty, not of certainty. Because when we feel that there is certainty, then we deactivate our own, also our own self-critical um, perspective and, and, and praxis. So this is pretty much what I wanted to share. I would like to mention a couple of more things, I am, which I probably should have said in the beginning. I am talking about this from, even if I'm currently in, in Germany, I'm talking about this from the perspective of someone who has always lived and worked in Latin America. So there might be differences with other contexts, of course. And also as someone who is safe in most Spaces, which is, of course, part of, of my own situation. And this, of, I imagine and I, I expect that this will be different. It would be different if I were actually someone who, because of my skin color or my identity or whatever, were actually unsafe. So I am pretty safe to circulate around different spaces. Um, which of course also marks my own, uh, I guess, um, hesitancy to, to accept safe spaces so easily because I am on the comfortable side of them, I guess. I have a text here that I'm working from, which as I say in the chat, you can um, see in full, you can read after the session if you want to. Um, this is, uh, what I have to contribute to this. And before I embark on it, I'd like to thank Eugenia and Katerina for their invitation to this event. It's tremendous to be in Bayreuth again, even if I'm not there physically. And uh, I'd like to thank Maria too for what she's had to say. So um, coming to this subject, uh, from where I do, um, I, I read through Professor Perez's remarks and um, I made a connection with some other discussions about the idea of sanctuary, safe spaces, places where you can get away from various kinds of attack and build a community which you hope will be separate from those kinds of pressures. And this got me thinking about um, Alistair McIntyre, who talks about this kind of thing in his wonderful book, After Virtue. And so I start from a rather famous quotation from the end of After Virtue. A crucial turning point, McIntyre says, in the epoch in which the Roman Empire declined into the Dark Ages, was when men and women of goodwill turned aside from the task of shoring up the Roman Imperium and ceased to identify the continuation of civility and moral community with that Imperium. What they set themselves to achieve instead was the construction of new forms of community within which the moral life could be sustained so that both morality and civility might survive the ages of barbarism and dark, darkness. It's like us for that. It's like that for us too. What matters at this stage is the construction of local forms of community within which civility and the intellectual and moral life can be sustained through the new dark ages, which are already upon us. And we're not entirely without hope. This time, however, 
The barbarians are not waiting beyond the frontiers. They've already been governing us for quite some time. And it's our lack of consciousness of this that con constitutes part of our predicament. We're waiting not for a goddo, but for another, doubtless very different, Saint Benedict. So Mackintyre's talking about a rather apocalyptic view of the history of ethics that he has. And he's comparing our situation to that of people in the time of St. Augustine, or perhaps the Boethius, um, people who lived in the fourth and fifth centuries, um, fifth to sixth centuries AD, respectively. There had been, it's part of this picture, that there had been a shared moral understanding, a generally accepted ethical order, and mutually agreed standards of excellence. Um, and ways of pursuing a variety of crafts or what Macintyre calls practices um, within a form of life. And there was a decline from this shared moral understanding into mutual incomprehension, an endless, hostile, non-rational, abusive, and both metaphorically and literally violent confrontation. The public use of reason for people in the age of Augustine or Boethius had become effectively impossible. There were still thoughtful and sincere seekers of the good. Um, such people always exist, but in new ways, with new intensity to a new level, people of goodwill found that they faced a choice between continuing to beat their heads against the walls of indifference, incomprehension, misinformation, malice, and rational incoherence that the public square offered, and leaving that square in order to develop more useful and fruitful lines of thought and discussion in places set aside for such projects, with people who actually were good faith interlocutors and not merely trolls of various kinds. In that situation, there was no realistic step forward except a step back. The public domain had become entirely inhospitable to the life of virtue. The only way to rebuild the life of virtue was to found smaller and more local communities within which it might be possible to practice the virtues and the technical skill-based pursuits, the practices, in which the virtues find their most natural expression. And that's what a lot of Augustine's and Boethius' contemporaries did, um, especially St. Benedict, um, whom Augustine appeals, uh, sorry, not Augustine, whom McIntyre appeals to at the end of the opening quotation. St. Benedict of Nursia in Italy, 480 to 548 AD, an almost exact contemporary of Boethius, the author of the foundation document of Western monasticism, the rule of St. Benedict, and the inspirer of many other people who promoted this life of withdrawing from a chaotic world into safe spaces. And something like the same pattern happened also um, in times of religious and political strife um, four or five hundred years later, the time of St. Bernard of Clairvaux and of St. Dominic and St. Francis. So the monasteries and the friaries of historic Christendom were founded exactly to be safe spaces, places where people of goodwill could pursue their particular vision of human flourishing under the kinds of purgation and training that are the necessary preliminaries to that flourishing together and in some greater or lesser degree of separation from the world. Now, we don't have to accept this as a faithfully historical picture. That's not really the point. Um, there are complications to add about every one of these claims. Um, and it's often been that critics of McIntyre, including myself, unfortunately, have been too quick to say, um, well, there never was a golden age of virtue, um, as if that was the end of McIntyre's view. But McIntyre, of course, agrees that there never was such a golden age. And he's written plenty, for example, about various supposed golden ages, um, the age of Pericles in Athens, or um, David Hume and Adam Smith's Edinburgh, uh, to demonstrate exactly that there were no golden ages, then there have been. But there doesn't have to have been a golden age for it to be possible and plausible to say that sometimes there are real declines in public reason, genuine deteriorations in the quality, the availability, and the political efficacy of the rational discord that, that is dominant in our society. And it doesn't seem unreasonable to suggest that we might be living through just such a decline perhaps even a deterioration steep and calamitous enough to make talk of the new dark ages even more justified now than it was when McIntyre published After Virtue. That might seem to be one of the most obvious lessons of just looking at the newspapers. And if that's right, then we need to consider remedies, and one we should at least take seriously 
is McIntyre's own, that we, if we are people of goodwill, should step back from the public sphere and build safe spaces for the virtues on a smaller scale and at a more local level. Well, what kind of local forms of community might there be that we could turn to in this uh, political and historical predicament? Well, there's the religious community, the, the kind of community, the kind of safe space that the original um, St. Benedict actually proposed. There's the local church, the Eucharistic community. There's the university, the community of learning. Um, there are, of course, other faith communities alongside churches and other ways of learning alongside universities. A local form of community we shouldn't neglect is simply the local community in the sense of the village or neighborhood within a city. Then there are trade unions, there are craft guilds, there are political and campaigning groups. Um, there are groups like this group that we're talking in now. And perhaps there are the kinds of groups characteristically um, found in the identity-based safe spaces that Dr. Perez has primarily in mind in her paper. Women's groups, women's refuges, trans-friendly spaces, gay-friendly spaces, and so on. Now, one problem with groups of this sort, um, if they're identity-based, is just that they're identity-based, as Dr. Perez has rightly stressed. They include one list of people, and they exclude another list of people, just on the basis of demographic markers like trans woman or lesbian or female or person of colour. From my own perspective as a trans woman, I think this policy of inclusion and exclusion is problematic because it tends to um, reinforce um, a falsehood that I think is dangerously discriminatory. In effect, the idea that any of these groups have just as such significant moral commonalities Activists mean well when they say that trans women or trans people or women or gays or people of colour or whatever group you like, they mean well when they say that these groups are good just in virtue of being what they are. So trans people are good just because they're trans people. It's a well-meaning utterance, but unfortunately it's simply not true. Trans people are just people and they're just as various in their moral character as any other people. Of course, there's a sense in which cosmopolitanly we want to say that all people are good certainly i'll sign up for that but it's also true of course that plenty of people who are good because their people are also bad um it's always a pleasure and often a need to hear positive and affirming things said about you as a trans person um it's nice when people say affirming things about trans people just as such but the identity politics that says that trans is as such automatically good um is, it seems to me the trouble with that is it's just the flip side of the identity politics that says trans is as such automatically bad. Um, I'm never quite sure what people mean when they complain about identity politics, but I think there's plainly something here to complain about. Now, safe spaces don't have to be built on demographic markers in quite that way. Um, it's also possible to build safe spaces by including or excluding not particular kinds of people but particular kinds of behaviour and attitude. And if we think of it that way, um, this is developing a line that Dr. Paris has been exploring a bit, then obvious examples of behaviour that are right candidates for exclusion from a safe space would have to include, well, all the kinds of things that go on um, in, online in debates about trans people at the moment. I won't take you through the rather wearisome list that I've got in that paragraph on page three. Um, but there's every reason to think that the way debate is published, is, pu is publicly conducted about trans people, for example, on Twitter, there's every reason to think that a lot of what goes on there is not in good faith and not motivated by anything but um, hostility to the existence of trans people. And if that's going on, then um, well, one thing that you often hear is that there's a kind of obligation to engage in debate. Well, no, there isn't, not if the debate is with people whose uh, bad faith is absolutely obvious um, and people who are simply concerned to catch you out, to wear you down, to abuse you, to make you look publicly ridiculous, um, to find ammunition for uh, defaming you. These kinds of things go on. They happen to me. And when that's going on in a public debate, you're not, I think, under any obligation to continue in it you're also um, at liberty to get out of such a space 
to exit this vexatiousness and take a time out somewhere that doesn't have those kinds of horrible features. So um, in that sense, I think, um, I, think I, I want to contest something that Dr. Perez says. I think that I do believe that in that sense, sense at any rate, there are safe spaces. There are places where you can get away from that flag. And my goodness, don't we all need them sometimes? If you were to operate a safe space which excluded people, not on the basis of the demographic markers, not on their identity as cis people or women or trans women or whatever it was, but if you were to run a safe space where the rule for exclusion uh, depends on behavior and attitude, then you'd have something a little bit like um, what McIntyre talks about when he talks about the rule of St. Benedict. That enjoins on the individual a change of heart, a change of way of life, and the way of life it enjoins is participation in a corporate life. It's a costly life, um, but it's also a safe life, um, at least on the assumption, which I'll come to in a moment, that we're not talking about an abusive community. Individual monks are penniless, they're chaste, and they have to be obedient to the prior. But they also owe each other love, zeal, and care, and they're specifically protected from each other's violence in deed and word. And their personal poverty is balanced by the community's duty to feed each and every one of them. They have all their goods in common. Um, so I think there's great potential in the possibility of localist communities where um, people experiment with ways of living together in community. And I know I have friends who have engaged in just this kind of um, experiment. They've tried setting up homes, um, partly under the economic pressure of rental costs in London, to be sure, but also for reasons to do with thinking about ethics. They've tried to set up homes where everyone in that home is in a safe space and where there's community living in the sense that although people may have romantic relationships and may have um, sexual partners, partners within the community, that's recognised and understood within the community. Nonetheless, it is community living. Um, it's a house where they're all together, where I believe there's a common purse. Um, I don't think they have to put all their money into it. Uh, they can also have their own accounts, but there is a common purse. And the house's um, groceries are bought collectively, and the house's rent is paid collectively. And of course, this too is something that one could experiment about, um, how much economic community um, one had within a house like that, and how deeply one took the duty to um, be open to other members of the house, how far you go with that, um, what you regard as an obligation to participate in the house's life. I think there's real um, potential. Um, I, I think it's the, the upside of the economic uh, hardship that young people in particular face in expensive modern cities like London. The upside of that is that people are experimenting with this kind of living. And I think that's ethically extremely interesting and could be very fruitful. Um, and as I say, such communities can be more or less um, all encompassing um, and we can experiment with the parameters. Safe space communities can be single purpose and single context. Like um, you might see this group we're in now as a safe space community with a single purpose in a single context. Reading groups are often like that. Academic study groups like this one are often like that. Weight Watchers clubs can be like that. The rule of St. Benedict prescribes an all-embracing and every context kind of safe space, but there are different ways of thinking about it. Um, so I, I, I think there is a lot of mileage in the idea of groups, communities, um, um, abris, to use the French word, Zuflucht, Ort, Orta. Um, I think there's a great deal of promise in conceptions like that for just the kind of moral rebuilding that McIntyre talks about in the original quotation. Um, I think we can use our imaginations and go off in all sorts of directions here. But what about the kind of objections that Dr. Perez wants to bring? Um, I'm, I'm deviating slightly from my text here. I'll just say two things very quickly and then get back to the text. The first thing is that there's something or can be something carceral about such structures because they, um, they're constitutively built upon the idea that if you don't 
abide by the ethos of the house, then you will be excluded. Um, I, I think that's just to be conceded, conceded to Dr. Perez. I think they do necessarily have this feature. Um, there has to be some way of setting a boundary to the experiment that you're engaged in. For it to be a space, a distinctive space, then it needs to have boundaries. And that means that there need to be admission and expulsion conditions. So um, that is a kind of drawback. I agree that that's a cost, but I think in, in a sense, it's a logical cost. I think it's part of the logic of having a safe space that it has to have boundaries. A second point that Dr. Perez um, rightly draws our attention to is that um, in safe spaces, um, the larger structures of society um, are not uh, things that we can simply just get away from. We want to get away from them in those safe spaces, and that isn't possible because, as Dr. Perez rightly points out, we bring with us into these safe spaces the baggage and the systems of oppression that those outer worlds define. And, of course, um, where we have a single parameter safe space and where the single parameter is some demographic marker, we get a kind of intersectionality problem. We're facing, we have to face up to the fact that people come with all sorts of baggage and people who are good feminists, good feminists in other respects, can also be racists. People who are good um, anti-racist can also be transphobic. People who are good trans allies can also be, unfortunately, um, not, not very high scoring on the feminism scale and inclined to racism. All of those are possible um, permutations and constellations of attitude. And if you define um, a safe space by a single parameter, a single demographic marker, then the, that kind of intersectional problem is always going to crop up. So one thing to say about that is um, that I guess that's the reason for taking safe spaces to be multi-parameter. If we make it part of what it is to be in a safe space, that you have to be all of trans-friendly, um, anti-racist and pro-feminist, um, then that perhaps helps us to set up the the founding conditions. But the deeper point that deeper Dr. Perez is making, I think, about um, when, when she says there are no safe spaces has to do with bringing toxicity in with us from the outside. Um, and I want to say, yes, that's absolutely right. There is that problem. I don't think it means that there literally are no safe spaces. I think it means that there, there are literally no absolutely safe spaces. It's never the case that we can get completely away from that kind of problem. It's also true, and I'll, I'll close by just drawing out this point a little, <coughs> it's also true that not only do we bring in um, the oppression, not, not only do we bring into the safe space the oppression that has afflicted us and with which we have afflicted others in the wider world, it's not only that, it's also that safe spaces um, can themselves be particularly brutal and particularly toxic environments precisely because of their intimacy. And um, I, I think we're all aware of the kinds of um, examples of this that have come up recently, tragic cases from a lot of churches and indeed a lot of religious houses um, of uh, manifest and multifarious uh, abuse, unfortunately, of those who are vulnerable within those communities. Um, this is a familiar thing. And um, tragically familiar thing. And as I say, the brutality and the toxicity is not just what's brought in from the outside to these safe spaces. They have their own um, distinctive, um, their own proprietary forms of toxicity. And I don't think that we can be comforted much about this. I don't think that it's possible to say, oh, well, it doesn't matter. Never mind. I think what we see here is something that makes safe spaces um, dangerous in a distinctive way. But I want to draw an analogy uh, with friendship and also with romantic love and suggest on the basis of that analogy that the story isn't over for safe spaces just because there's this problem. So think of Iago and Othello. That is a toxic friendship. And it's only because they're friends that Iago has the opportunity to destroy Othello. Othello insists on saying that he loves Iago Iago insists on saying that he loves Othello. This is sometimes taken to be um, signs of a 
gay relationship between us. I don't think it's necessary to see it that way, to understand that what happens between them happens because it happens of the, uh, the intimacy of a toxic friendship. Now, someone might say about our society, I'd want to say about our society, that it doesn't give sufficient spaces for the exercise and the cultivation and the practice of friendship. And I think that's true. I think it's an important truth about our society, but it is um, unfriendly to friendship in that way. Um, someone might respond to my saying that with, oh, but friendships can be um, distinctively toxic. To which my answer would be, yes, of course they can. Certainly they can. That doesn't mean that friendship isn't, um, by and large, a very great good of which we have reason to regret the absence and the diminution in our society. And I want to say, this is the argument, Ben Energy, I want to say the same about romantic love. That's a different paper. I want to say the same about safe spaces and community living. I think, of course, it has special dangers, but it also has special rewards. And like friendship, it's something that we should value and want a high place for in our society. Um, so uh, what I come down to then is something less dramatic than McIntyre's um, all or nothing picture in which safe spaces are the only place where we can be safe to develop the virtues and something less dramatic and perhaps more nuanced than Dr. Perry's position that no spaces are safe. Though I take something from both McIntyre and Dr. Perry's in what I want to say, I want to say that um, we should be kind of opportunist about both the public space and also safe spaces. We should be a little bit wary in both realms. We should take on board McIntyre's very well justified skepticism about public reason in our society. We should see it happening when people who are trying to be uh, trans allies, for example, or spokespeople for trans people are just getting beaten up on Twitter. We should be alert to it when that's happening to us, and we should beat a tactical or even a strategic retreat at that point. We should get the hell out of there because it's doing us no good and we're not achieving anything. Um, so sometimes we need to retreat from the public sphere. Absolutely, I agree with McIntyre about that. Um, and sometimes we need, therefore, safe spaces into which to retreat. But at the same time, taking on board Dr. Paris's points about the dangers of safe spaces, um, the particular ways in which safe spaces are unsafe, I want to say that we also need to be sceptical and a little bit wary in our, the ways we operate in safe spaces. Sorry, I was thinking here of a wonderful book by Garrard Conley, Boy Erased, which was made into a film about two years after it came out as a book. Um, so this is someone from what the people who live in it will call a safe space, from a, from a Southern Baptist Christian community in the US. But Conley, Garrard Conley, who lives in that environment, is getting brainwashed. He's getting conversion therapy. He's being forced to pray the gay away because he is gay, his family know this about him, and they try to beat it out of him. So um, there, what happens to Conley? How does he get away from that? Well, often people get away from that um, in one of three ways in particular. First, they go from that safe space to another safe space. That's one possibility. Secondly, they go from that safe space to simply a kind of individualist autonomy. They come to understand that um, this shouldn't be happening to them, that this isn't who they are, however safe the space may appear or have appeared, it is actually a space of psychological, maybe even physical abuse, and they are entitled to get out of there, and they are entitled to say, that's not me, I don't judge myself that way, I don't live in that kind of space. So the, the second kind of way out of an abusive safe space is into personal autonomy. And the third way uh, the, the first way was into another safe space. And the third way, and this is particularly interesting, is that um, you can also escape an abusive safe space by going into the public space. And that, in effect, is what Garrard Conley has done by writing a book about it. So um, a kind of pragmatism. We know there are bad things out there in the public sphere, but for all sorts of reasons, we won't entirely give up on out there. We'll look for victories and advances where they're possible, even though they're only small ones, and even though we quite understand that by and large public rationality in our society isn't in a good way. A lot of our energies and our main hopes will go elsewhere into local communities and safe space networks, 
that we're seeking to build as context for the practice of the virtues. But that's not an exclusive alternative to engagement in the public space. Um, it is a complement to such engagement. It's not either or, it's both. And just as we have reason to be a little bit distanced from much of what goes on in the public space, so we might find good reflective reason to distance ourselves a little and be watchfully pessimistic about localist communities too. We should achieve what we can within both contexts, but we should never forget that as Dr. Perez rightly says, neither context is ever going to be completely safe. And that in either context, the higher our ideals, the likelier it is that we'll fail. As has rightly been said, um, I was trying to work out who said this. I think it's very true. And of course, it applies to the church context that I've been talking about in a lot of these uh, reflections, mutate the mutanda for other contexts. Um, but it's, it's true, I think, to say that the Christian is not an optimist, that she is a hopeful person, and whether or not you yourself are a person of faith, um, I suppose that's an attitude that I commend to you. Um, never mind about uh, optimism, but do think about hope. Thank you.